the glory land and the road is bright for Jesus is the light and I hold his guiding hand I have found the way is so near I will bravely meet the foe happy songs I'll sing in honor to the king and to glory onward go well I, I have found the way, way. soul's eternal home. Well, I, I have found, found the way. way. Oh, so good. Why don't you take a moment and shake someone's hand next to you and tell them how glad you are to see them in the house of the Lord this evening. God bless you. Greet each other in the name.
God bless you. You may return to your seats and be seated. Thank you so much for being here this evening. And we're going to ask our ushers to come at this time as we prepare to receive our Wednesday evening tithe and offering. And as our ushers are coming, we want to remind everyone that this coming Sunday is going to be our annual shift service. It is a service uh, for our young people, basically a graduation service to where they move from uh, one class to another. Some will uh, move out of nursery into our children's ministry, all stars and little stars, and then some will move up from all stars into the youth group, and uh, some will move up to our hyphen college and career age group there. And so this is going to be a uh, our annual shift service this coming Sunday, and uh, our very own uh, bishop will be our speaker this Sunday, so you do not want to miss that our bishop is going to be preaching a youth service and so uh, looking forward to that having a great time there or here on Sunday and uh, then the week after that following this coming Sunday after that we are starting our 10 a.m. and 1 p.m. services on Sunday our worship service times will be 10 a.m. and 1 p.m. And we're getting all of our promotional material ready for that new church cards and a new sign for the road that uh, gives the correct times. And uh, we want to encourage you to uh, come to one or the other or, or both. If you come to one, you're not going to miss the uh, something uh, you're, uh, that we do at another service. They will be a mirrored service there. And so the plans are anyways. But ultimately, we plan on following the will of God and the moving of the Holy Ghost as we do in every service and so we want to encourage you to be here and uh, be with us as your schedule would allow. Ushers come at this time. The Bible says given it shall be given unto you good measure pressed down, shaken together and running over shall men give into your bosom for with the same measure that you meet with all it shall be measured to you again Luke 6 38 and everyone say the Bible Amen. We know it to be the unfailing word of God. Amen. Let's bow our heads together and pray over this offering. Shall we? Mighty God, we love you. We praise your name. Thank you for all that you've done and all that you're continuing to do. Thank you for this opportunity to come into your house to worship you in giving to your kingdom work. Tonight, Lord, we pray that you bless this offering, bless the gift and the giver. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And everyone together said amen. God bless you as our ushers serve you this evening. to pray for Brother Bo Chandler and Sister Gail Chandler. And uh, Sister Gail, did she break her foot? Fracture. Okay. All right. I understand. Goodness gracious. Well, we will definitely be in prayer for them. And we also want to pray for Sister Helen McPherson. And she is in a rehab center we want to pray that God would give her strength to recover. Also, Sister Lynn Fagler is not feeling well tonight. We want to remember her in our prayer. And uh, do we have any prayer requests that were, were turned in this evening? If, if that is all, if you have any unspoken requests or spoken, any spoken requests? Yes, ma'am.
Absolutely. Amen. Yes, ma'am. definitely do that if yes sir support we uh one of the one of our back alley people uh, asked us to pray for them to get transportation and so we had prayer and then he came by yesterday afternoon on the bicycle All so right. god answers prayer amen amen <laughs> praise god for that amen if you have a special unspoken request would you signify it by the uplifting of your hand someone yes sir absolutely believe that amen praise god the lord is always watching out for his children amen let's all stand together we're going to take these needs before the lord if you have any special needs that you would like to come forward and allow the ministry to lay hands and pray over you you may do so at this time let's lift our hands and take these needs before the lord shall we mighty god we love you we praise your name thank you for this opportunity to bring our needs before your throne tonight Lord, we pray that you would touch each and every one of these requests, God, all the spoken, all the unspoken. Lord, we pray that your perfect will would be done in each and every one of these situations. God, we pray that you would open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessings. Lord, we pray that you would give strength to those that are weak. Lord, we pray that you would bring a quick, expedient recovery to those that need your healing, oh God. And Lord, we put it into your hands faith believing, trusting in you for all things, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ we pray.
Can we give the Lord a hand up of praise? Magnify the Lord. As you remain standing for just a minute, we're going to put our scripture text on the screen. It is Matthew 18, verses 15 through 19. <clears throat> more and more as we move down the timeline toward the end, perilous times and a mighty revival, an outpouring of the Spirit upon all flesh runs concurrent to the perilous times. But it's a, it's a time of revelation when more and more we will, it will be revealed to us how much we need Him. We have learned in prosperity to function pretty much on our own. We have jobs, we make a pretty good living, we have a place to live, food to eat, we pretty much can make it. But the end time is going to bring new challenges to us. And if we have not learned to lean on Him, we need to start. So that we can look to him and lean on him. Our blessing, I think, in the future over our food is going to be more than just a routine. Something we do because it's what we're supposed to do. I think the time will come when we're actually thanking God sincerely and honestly for a piece of bread and a glass of water. I'm not negative. I'm not being fatalistic. I think I'm being prophetically realistic. Perilous times, mighty outpouring of the Holy Ghost. I want to speak tonight, I want to begin a series tonight on answered prayers. Answered prayers. And this will be my text. I'm going to have to lay some foundation, create a context for my message. So I'll spend a little time tonight, I don't know how much time, but I'll spend a little time on laying foundation and creating context for the message that I want to preach or the series. So don't think that I'm senile and I'm off my target. I'm not off my target. I'm just trying to create a context for us. I know where I'm going and uh, I expect to get there in the next one or two or three <coughs> or four services. Thank you. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, Go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching any thing that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. Powerful, powerful scripture, verse 19. And this is where I'm going. Verse 19, but I'm going, to, I'm going to take a little while to get there, so don't think that I forgot. I remember. I'm going to get you there, but I want to put some context in so we know what we're talking about. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you tonight for this gathering of your people. Speak to us. Speak to our hearts tonight, Lord. I pray that you will give to this congregation more than what I'm able to give them by the words that I say, but that you will give them something out of that more, even than what I could put into it. We rely on you to do that, but give us all what we need tonight. In Jesus' name, everyone together said amen. amen. Thank you. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. 
Verse 15 is where I'll start. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. <clears throat> if he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. This, this has to do with judging a matter. Now, sometimes you hear it said that we shouldn't judge. We shouldn't judge. We shouldn't judge. That's true in the right context. But it's, it's not true in every context. Sometimes we, we have to make judgments. This particular thing is talking about the judging of a matter. It's not necessarily the judging of a person's heart, a judging of their motive. Uh, it's the judging of a certain particular kind of a behavior that is offensive. It's actually called a fault between two people, a thing that occurs between two people. And we just finished talking. I spent several weeks teaching about how we interact with people in the household of faith, how that it's not, it's not reasonable to assume that we can live together in the household of faith and always agree on everything. That's not going to happen. And it's not true that if we ever disagree with someone that's a believer, that we've sinned. And if that's the case, I mentioned that last week, married couples would be in jeopardy all the time. Probably wouldn't be any married couples to even be saved if, you know, if sinning, uh, if disagreeing constituted a sin. And so that's not what he's saying. That's not what that was talking about. That's not what this is talking about. But he's talking about an issue between two people. A certain particular behavior could involve language and behavior, probably both of them. And it's offensive to one of them, it's declared to be a trespass. And so go to him and speak to him in private. And if he will hear you, then you guys can work through this or you ladies can work through this or a man and a woman can work through this and you'll gain, regain a brother or a sister. However, if the person that you go to will not hear you, then you should take with you one or two more people and you should carefully choose the people that you take with you so that you don't take the mouth of the South, so that you don't take people that, that you know are going to uh, make the situation worse than it is. And even if you settle it, they might not let it go. Take someone that you understand to be reliable and trustworthy and a person, a man or woman of great integrity who will be honest and sincere in this matter. Take them with you, one or two more with you, that in the mouth of two of the witnesses, every word could be established. Have someone there that, if necessary, can say to you, you know, you might, you might have taken this the wrong way. You know, you might take someone with you that can help you with it. This is reasonable things. This lays over into what I just finished. That's why I put the series here. This is talking about the household of faith. And if they shall neglect to hear, hear them, if they don't hear the two that you go back with, the one or two that you take back with you and they haven't heard you, then another option is that you can take this to the church. Now, this was actually written uh, before the church as we know it even came into being. The word here is ecclesia, but it actually has to do with an assembly of elders or an assembly of people or a segment of people taken from a larger assembly as a delegate assembly to hear a particular matter. It's referred to here as the ecclesia, the gathering, or it's translated the church. It would apply to the church today. The church would have this kind of authority to hear a matter. So if they don't hear you, let them go to the church. If they neglect to hear the church, then you would have to deal with them as a heathen and a publican. You couldn't deal with them under the guidelines of the scripture because they aren't going to hear that. You would deal with them as someone who disregards the scripture. And if it were to go further, you'd have to choose an alternative other than the church to deal with it in. That's what that said. Now, verse 18. Verily I say unto thee, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything, that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. These two kind of go together, but I'm going to use 18 to kind of introduce 19. Whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. We understand that 
that this is not an arbitrary statement. It's not saying that anything that you decide to bind on earth, then God is obligated to bind that in heaven. Whatever you think about a situation, you just get somebody to agree with you, and when the two of you agree, then heaven has to fall in line behind what you've agreed to do. That's, that's not what this is saying. This would be really ludicrous. What it is saying is that we must ascertain what is already bound in heaven, what the governing principles are in heaven, and then we take those principles and pull them down and measure our circumstance by the principles that are already set in the heavens. So that we are not arbitrarily causing God to have to fall in line with us, but we are intentionally falling in line with God. The decisions to bind and loose are not arbitrary, but they're based primarily on the Word of God and on the will of God. We see this in the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6 and 10. He prays, Thy kingdom come. He was praying for the coming and the establishment of the kingdom of God on the earth. That's what he was praying about. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He said, I'm praying about the kingdom, but I know that if I'm going to pray that the kingdom come and the kingdom be established, I'm obligated to pray that prayer according to the will and the word of God. We've got to understand that there's a, there's a definitive outline for the building of God's church. There's a definitive outline for the structure of the kingdom. It is not arbitrarily set by men, but it is already divinely set by God. So we, it is our responsibility in judging, engaging matters that have to do with the kingdom of God that we are to know and pray always, I want to make sure that what I do in this situation is in a line with the will of God and the word of God. Jesus prayed that. We should also have the same kind of prayer. The decision of the church or the assembly delegate that's put together by the church is based upon hearing the matter before them and then applying heavenly principle to that matter, which is the will of God and the word of God in order to resolve the matter. And then and only then is the decision binding in heaven. If we take a situation to the church or a delegate of the church and they hear the situation, their decision isn't that they meet somewhere and they agree as a party of three or four that this is what we think should be done. Right. So once we decide this, we're going to bind heaven to this agreement. Right. But, but what they do, the three or four on the delegate gets together and they pray and they seek what is the heavenly principle that applies to this situation? It's already set in heaven. It's already bound in heaven or it's already loose in heaven. So we have to discover what that is from the will of God and the word of God. And then we go get that principle and bring it down here and apply it to this situation. The government of God is set. We aren't to make it. We aren't to put it together. We aren't to arbitrarily decide one thing or the other about the administration of God's kingdom. It's already done. He finished his work from the foundation. It's finished. It's done. All the principles are already in place for every situation that might occur. We just have to go find them and pull them down into our situation and apply them to our circumstance in order to make a valid judgment about a matter. So it's not how many people might agree with you about a situation. It's does the Word of God and does the will of God agree with you and your decision that you made regarding this matter. You might find six or eight or ten other people even more carnal than you that will agree with some ridiculous situation that you've made. It won't make it right because you have more people agreeing with you than the other person has with them. What makes it right is, that, is this principle in line 
with the will of God and the word of God. Can I pull a line on, on the principle I'm using in this situation? Can I pull a line from there over here and plug it into the word of God? This is what we have to do. We are not wise enough to administrate the spiritual kingdom of God. Can't do it. We have to use his principle. That's why Jesus, when he prayed, said, I'm praying about the coming kingdom. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Jesus was God manifest in the flesh, praying, of course, flesh to the spirit. And the flesh of the man Christ Jesus said, I can't do this. I've got to pray the coming kingdom according to God's will and God's word. If Jesus felt the need to do this, how much more should we today, we are spirit-filled, but we are not the same as was the man Christ Jesus. We're spirit-filled, but we are compelled by his example to say, I need to know what is the will of God in the building of the kingdom. I got to know. I want to work this out, but I must work it out according to spiritual principle, the will of God and the word of God. The scripture is not saying that if we decide to bind a matter on earth, God is bound to comply to our action and bind the thing in heaven. Aren't you glad of that? Amen. Aren't you glad that the Lord just doesn't throw it out here and say, okay, whatever you decide to do, I'll endorse it? Ooh. Aren't you glad? He did, how, what kind of mess would we be in if that were the case? And every man's way is right, the Bible says, in his own eyes. So what you'd have is a multitude of chaos in the administration of the government of God in the church. So he didn't say that. That's not what he meant. So we need to get that out of our head. And I've had someone, I've had people tell me, well, whatever we bind, God's going to bind. Well, that's not exactly the way it is. Whatever he bounds, we bind. Whatever he looses, we lose. And sometimes I have seen after years of pastoring, sometimes we want to bind what he hasn't bound. And sometimes we want to loose what he hasn't loose. Right. The whole idea is to know what has he bound and what has he loosed. And those things are the things that we bind. We have the authority to bind what he has bound. God gives the church the authority to loose what he has loosed. The scripture is actually saying whatsoever you bind on earth, shall be bound in heaven, is actually teaching us that we must understand whatever is bound or loosed by the principles of God's will in the heavens, we can also bind and loose on the earth. Because only heaven's principle can bind or loose earthly matters. It's just a, not what I think. Elder Wheatley sometime would just stop the board meeting and we'd be in a discussion on the district board and sometimes he'd just stop the meeting. He'd just stop the discussion and there were a few of us who liked to talk and we'd be giving an opinion about this, an opinion about that, or something else and he'd just stop it, stop it. And uh, I remember one time in particular he looked at Brother Davis and said, shut up. I thought, boy, that's good. He looked at me and said, shut up. I said, uh-oh. Then he looked at Ed Wheatley and said, shut up. He could do that. We'd let him say anything he wanted to. We loved him that much. But then he said, let's pray. Let's pray. He said, you got too much carnal thinking here. It's got too much people thought in this. So we prayed. And we, we came up with an entirely different decision than the one we would have come up with headed in the direction right. we were going right. because we prayed and while we were sincere we got caught up in our own opinion yeah. we got caught up in our own thoughts and sometimes when you have strong opinions and and of course brother Wheatland brother Davis has strong opinions and <laughs> sometimes I do but we got caught up in this and brother Wheatland pulled us back in that's a good example of what we're talking about here. Let's make sure that in judging a matter that we appeal to heaven. Right. 
We appeal to the counsel of the will of God and the word of God. I need to know what the Bible says. What does God say? What does the Lord say about this? What does the Scripture say about this? How, how, I know how I feel about it, but how am I supposed to feel? Only heavenly principle can bind or loose earthly matters. In the Lord's Prayer, we are clearly taught that our prayers concerning the coming of God's kingdom in the earth, which includes binding and loosing, are to always be prayed according to the will of God and in alignment with the principles of the word of God. Go to the book. Look for it in the book. Find something in the book to tag it to, something in the book to hook it to. We need to use the book, the unfailing word of God. Everything else will pass away, but my word will not pass away. And it is in this context that I'm just talking to you about right now. The principles of heaven that govern the affairs of man. I'm talking about the, in this context that Jesus says what we find in verse 19. This is the context. When he said, put verse 19 back up there. I'm going to read that. Now the context that we're in here is what matters is the principles of heaven. That's where we are. That's what he's talking about. That's the context. He just spent quite a time saying that we can bind things on earth and bind things in heaven, but those things are the things that must be in alignment with the will of God and the word of God. That's what Jesus prays. So we get that example. They have to be brought together in this. And in this context, here is what he says. Again, I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father, which is in heaven. There are two things here. There's the proper way to ask, and then there is the assurance of an answer. Those are the two things in verse 19 that I want to talk about. In the context that, that the word of God and the will of God is preeminent. The proper way to ask and the assurance of an answer. First of all, this is not saying that two people who are believers can arbitrarily pick out anything they choose. And by agreeing on it, they can ask for it to be done, and it shall be done for them by the Father. Now, sometimes that's kind of what we get from this, is that two people can just agree on it. I'm going to get somebody to agree with me on this. I might have to look around for a while, but I'm going to get somebody to agree on me on this. I'll finally find somebody who will agree with me on this, and we're going to agree, we're going to pray about it, and once we pray about it, God's got to do it. Because we agree on it. That's not what it's saying. Not saying It's not saying that. The context, remember, is that we are praying according to the will and the word of God. If this were the case, and there were no heavenly principles for a proper prayer request, <laughs> then believers would always win the lottery. Next time they got $3 million, probably you find somebody to agree with you that you're going to win it. <laughs> so we're going to win this thing. Hey, hey, hey. Will you agree with me? We're going to win it. And we would pray the prayer and agree on it, and we'd win the lottery. Yeah. yeah. We would control and dominate the stock market. We wouldn't need a newspaper. We'd just pick out a stock we liked, and, and we'd just bind it together on it and pray about it and shoot it through the roof because we'd have that kind of power. We would control the outcome of every presidential election. If we could do that, we just find somebody in this election who agree with us about who ought to be president, and we bind together on it. Oh, yes! A glory, glory, glory. It shall be done. Woo. If we could do that, we'd, we'd do that. We would own all the banks and control the wealth of the world. 
Don't look at me funny. That's what I would do that. I know me enough to know that's what I'd be out about, but I know better. I know that's not what this is talking about. James calls these kind of prayers asking amiss. In James 4 and 3, he says, You ask and you receive not because you ask amiss that you might consume it upon your lust. And that's what's happening when we ask out of alignment with the will and the word of God. We are asking according to what we want, our own desire. And even if you find someone to agree with you, it's not an effective way to pray. It's just not going to work. Car carnal thinking, human agreement does not bind heaven. Conscientious request of the Lord in alignment with the word of God is what compels heaven to move. That's why Jesus prayed. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. I'm praying that the building of the kingdom, every block I lay, every foundation we put down, every Bible study we teach is in alignment with the will and the word of God. It's not about finding somebody to endorse my thought and my idea. It's about my endorsing the thoughts and ideas of the will and the word of God. Thy kingdom come. We understand that the anything that the two agree on has to be in alignment with the word of God and the will of God. It has to be. If we are praying an effective prayer and I have someone to agree with me, then I have them to agree with me according to principle of the Bible. I say, this is what the Scripture says. This is what the Scripture teaches us. Right. Let's covenant together that we yes. believe that God will do Absolutely. what He said He will do. I'm praying the will of God. I'm yes. praying the Word of God. I've got agreement here to help me. doesn't make the Word of God any more true to have somebody with you. It just sometimes helps us to have somebody with us. Right. 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 So now we've got two people who are in covenant together with the Word and the will of God. And He said, if you pray my Word, and you pray, my will, the Father, will work. Yes, sir. Now, sometimes that's still kind of hard for us to catch. The principles that set forth the perimeters for our prayer are all in the will and the word of God, every one of them. When two or three come to a principled agreement as touching a matter in prayer, then the prayer has integrity and they can ask for what they want and it shall be done. This is the proper way to ask. Now, I don't want you to get hung up on every prayer being answered. Don't, don't go there yet. I'll, I'll help you in a minute. Now, let's talk about the assurance of an answer. We've talked about the right way to pray. The proper way to pray, to find someone to agree with you, is to pray in alignment with the will and the word of God. It has to be. If we do that, the Lord says, you will get an answer if you do this. You will. Right. Now let's talk about the assurance of an answer. Let's go back to verse 19. Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father. Now, I want to go back to the two of them. Now, most often we think of the two of them as being two people, two, two believers. And I think it, it can be two believers in number. But ideally what it's saying is two have to agree. Let me give you what that is. The first one, as I am one, his word is two. Where two agree. Where Brother Beasley and the word agree as touching a matter. Not just two people. It can be 
Brother Beasley and Sister Beasley, which is two people, and the Word. That would make it three. It says two are three. So it could be three, Brother Beasley, Sister Beasley, and the Word of God. But it's not principled unless the Word of God is a part of the agreement. It loses its power of principle. You might as well be saying your ABCs. Or it might as well be quoting poetry. As you would to do anything. Unless it's founded upon the principle of the Word of God, our prayers are not going to be effective. Jesus set the example. We got to pray. So too. First of all, I want to make sure that when I'm praying, I'm hooked into here. I'm praying hooked in the Word of God. Now, I'm going to get somebody else with me. That's okay. Two, three, four, five, ten. Doesn't matter. Whoever I get with me to agree with me has to also agree with this. Because this is the key to the answer prayer. So, if we pray according to the Word of God, and he says, it's going to be done. Now, this is where we sometimes get tripped up. And that's why I titled the series Answered Prayers. is because I want you to know that a lot of your prayers have been answered that you don't believe have been answered. A lot of your prayers have been answered that you haven't given God gratitude for. Because you aren't aware that he answered them. I know. Sometimes I have gone and said, Lord, we prayed about this, prayed about this, prayed about this, and then the Lord would just reveal to me in the Spirit what He had done that I didn't see. And I had to apologize to God. We often focus on the immediate and visible answers to prayer. That's very often what we look for. We want the lame man in the beautiful gate kind of answer to our prayer. Peter and John went down. They prayed for God to heal this man, and bingo. Wow. Wow. Right down. The Lord came down and spiritually healed this guy. He was running and dancing and jumping and magnifying the Lord. That's the kind of prayer we like. We like to pray those kind of prayers where we can see an immediate, visible answer to our prayer so we can say, yay, hallelujah, look what the Lord has done. I can see it. I can touch that guy. Look at him run. Watch him jump. Wow, how great is that? Or we will, Jesus stood outside the tomb of dead Lazarus and prayed for him and immediately out of the tomb. Before he prayed, he said, move the stone. This guy's coming out. This guy's coming out. Move the stone. And he prayed, and this guy came out. We like those kind of answers. Wow. You pray, bingo. There it is. It happens. Not only do we know it, but everybody else that knows we prayed knows we got an answer. We feel good about that. People say, boy, you prayed, something happened. Well, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. We act humble. But we like those kind of answers. I mean, Paul prayed for a guy that fell out of the window. Healed him. Paul prayed for him. He came back to life. Immediate answer. Quick. Isn't that amazing? That's what we like. We like those kind of answers. I like those kind of answers. You like those kind of answers. I like them. You like them. All God's children like them. But the fact is, that's not always the way it happens. And the fact is that in my experience, more often than not, we don't really see what God has done in response to what we have prayed. Very often. If we agree with someone to help us pray and we judge answered prayer only by whether or not we see results, we may often find that we are frustrated, 
And we may even think that God has not heard us or is just not answering us. I'm going to read that to you again. I wrote it down so I can read it twice. If we agree with someone to help us pray, and we judge answered prayer only by whether or not we see the results, we may often find that we are frustrated, and we may even think that God has not heard us, or He is just not answering us. But answered prayer, even when the answer is yes, cannot be accurately measured only by visible results. I had a man come to me years ago in the church, not this church, but another church. He asked me to pray. He said, I'm in a dire financial situation. I want you to help me pray. I need to, to have this, this much money by the end of the week. That was on Sunday. He needed to have it by next, the next Saturday. He had seven days. He said, I've got to have it or I'm going to lose my home. And uh, they've given me a reprieve, and we're seven days to the end of that reprieve, and I've got to pay this, or I'm going to lose my house. I said, okay, we're going to pray. He said, I don't want you to announce it to the church, but he said, I want you to pray with me here in the office. So I did. I prayed with him. And I really felt a connection when I prayed with him. And I, I told him when we prayed, I just felt the Spirit confirm what was going to happen here. And I told him, I said, the Lord has confirmed to me, I don't know about you, but the Lord confirmed to me that he is going to answer this prayer. And the next Sunday, I was out of town that week, but the next Sunday he came back to church and his testimony was, well, I want you to know that I found a place to move to, but they've taken my house. And uh, I thought, well, I wondered what happened with this. But as soon as church was over, his sister came to me and she said, I want to tell you something. She said he needed $900 to stay in his house. And someone called him and told him they would give him a job. He would work for them three days. They would pay him $900. And he said that he was worth more than that. That the kind of work he did would command a higher fee than just $900 for three days. And he didn't do it. Now, let me ask you. He lost his house. Did God answer the prayer? Isn't that something? I didn't see any visible results. I saw him move out of his house. I saw him lose his house. They repossessed it. So if I would have not known the other part of the story and I would not have trusted God, then I would have wondered, did God not hear me? Did God just not answer my prayer? Does God just not care? But the fact of the matter is, when I knew the whole story, God answered the prayer. The man simply wouldn't take the answer. Right. That's good. That's good. Dummy. <laughs> so the point I'm making is that often when we pray, prayers that involve other people, and most of our prayers involve other people. God regards the will of other men. And while God may come to you and bring you the answer that I prayed that he would give you, you may be too stubborn, not just you personally, but you may be too stubborn to take it. And then you don't get it. When we've been praying, we agreed, and the Lord said, if you agree on it, I will do it. Where does that leave us? It looks to us like he didn't do it. Did his word fail? The whole point I'm trying to tell you here is that once we comply with the word, once we are in agreement with the will and the word of God, and we covenant with God and someone else to pray over a matter, God said, I'll answer that for you. That doesn't mean that the answer that I bring to the people you're praying for will in actuality be lived out because I will not take their will away from them. They can say no. They can say no. No. Well, 
The point I'm making is we need to learn to trust him. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him. How I proved him or and or and or. I promise you, if you could go back behind yourself and check on your prayers, you'd find out that God has not failed you. God has not failed you. God has answered prayers for you time and time and time again. But the people he delivered the answer to just wouldn't take it. And you've gone off frustrated because you didn't know why God didn't hear you, why God didn't answer. He does hear you. He does answer. We just need to learn to trust him and believe him. I believe you, God. I believe you're as good as your word. My wife and I pray for our children and our grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Some of them are, are out there going a, a direction that carries them away from the truth as we know it. And we keep praying and, and nothing's happened. My wife said, honey, what's going on? I said, well, God is talking to them. They just aren't listening. Every time we pray for God to talk to them, understand this. If it's in alignment with his word, he talks to them. They may not listen, but he talks to them. He goes to them. He speaks to their heart. He speaks to their spirit. We cannot not believe God will do what he says he will do. Oh, for grace to trust him more. I want to learn that I can trust you. Some men trust in horses. Some men trust in chariots. But I will trust in the name of the Lord. <laughs> it's not going to be a horse. not going to be a chariot. not going to be a bank. not going to be something natural. not going to be people. It's going to be him. And I got to believe he's going to do what he said he would do. And he said, I will answer when you covenant with me according to Bible principle. I will answer. I will answer. I will answer. I told this story before. My wife asked me to go to church. I was not in the church at the time. She asked, she said, I want you to go to revival. I said, I'm not going. She said, well, once you get home in time, I said, I'll get home in time. I, I don't want to go. <laughs> I don't want to go. I don't want to hear that guy preach. He preaches too long. He preaches too loud. And I, just, I don't want to go. So I'm not going to go. But she said the Lord told her when she covenanted in prayer with the sisters of the church, said, you press his clothes. Press his shirt, press his tie, press his pants, press his coat, hang him on the door, put the shoes out there, and he'll come to church. So she said she did that. Now, I didn't know she'd done that. I came home and they were hanging on the door. I thought, la di da. What does she think she's doing here? But, but you know, I found myself getting ready to go to church. I thought, well, what's going on? I said, I'm going to get dressed, but I ain't going to church. So I got dressed, and then I found myself headed toward the Porterdale Church. Then I said, I'm going to go to Porterdale, but I ain't going to the church. <laughs> then I got to Porterdale, and I found myself headed toward the church. I said, I'm going to go to the parking lot and sit in the car in the parking lot. I ain't going in. So I found myself in the parking lot. found myself getting out, and I said, I'm just going to the bathroom. That's as far as I'm going. I'm stopping at the toilet. <laughs> I ain't going no further. I found myself upstairs. I thought, I'm sitting here, but as soon as he gets through preaching, I'm out of here. See, what God does is he answers prayer. Sometimes we see it. She was amazed at what she saw. The people who prayed were amazed at what they saw. I was amazed. But so many times we don't see the visible results. And the devil says, see there, see there, see there, see there. You just got through praying for your son and you felt so good about him and he stopped by the house and said all these ridiculous, nutty things on, to man. you and the devil said, see there, you pray for him, he gets further away. Well, you're a liar, devil. That's right. You're a liar, you're pride. Listen, devil, you're a liar. Right. You're a liar. I know God is working. I trust him. I believe in him. I haven't got to see the water turn to wine to believe God can do it. I haven't got to see things happening to believe that God is working. I know God will do what he says he will do. That doesn't mean he'll take away the will of men and women and force them to do 
but it does mean he will not fail to knock on their door. He will not fail to speak to their heart. He will not fail to visit them and trouble their sleep. He will not fail you. He will not fail you if you pray in alignment with his word and his will. He will not fail you. Answered prayer. It's all around us. It's all around us. Jesus, I'm going to close with this. I'm just going to introduce it, really. Jesus prayed for Simon Peter in Luke 22, verse 31 through 34. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. The devil wants you. The devil wants you. He knows what's on the agenda for you. He knows you're going to be great. He doesn't know the future, but he knows that you're measured for greatness. He knows that. And he wants to get you to take everything out of you of value. He wants to empty you. But I have prayed for you. <laughs> Jesus said, I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. Right. When thou converted, strengthen the brethren. Verse 33. And he said unto him, Lord, I'm ready to go with thee, both to prison and to death. The Lord prayed for his faith not to fail, and his arrogance kicked in. It was like Peter said to the Lord, no need to do that. I'm okay. I'm good to go. I go to prison, I'll even die. But God doesn't force his will on an arrogant heart. But he will answer. It's, it would be wrong for us to imagine that the prayer that Jesus prayed wasn't heard by the Father and acted on by the Father. It just wasn't received by Peter at that point in time. And he went right out of there and did this terrible thing after the Lord just prayed for him for his faith not to fail. Someone called me the other week and said, I prayed for this guy on the altar, Brother Pastor, and, and he, he left the church and went out and got high. I don't know what I'm going to do anymore. I said, what's that got to do with anything? He said, well, you know, why pray for these people? They're just going to go out and get high again. I said, what did it hurt for you to pray for him? He said, well, I felt like God touched him. I said, God did touch him. God didn't endorse him getting high. He's just too stubborn to listen to God. But you don't need to get upset with God because this guy got high. God didn't get high. This guy was talked to by the Holy Ghost. He was prayed for by you. God honored your prayer. God touched his heart. He just did not receive what God had for him, so he got high. Well, what do you do with somebody like that? I say, here's what you do. Next time he comes, pray for him. Pray for him. Just keep praying. We hope that one of these times it's going to take. Just keep praying. We don't need to give up. Be not weary and well do it. Because I'll pray for you four times, bozo. That's it. <laughs> this is the last time. If you don't straighten up this time, don't come back no more. <laughs> no more, no more. Hit the road, Jack. <laughs> and don't you come back no more. Well, but the idea is that we need to remember that God doesn't fail us. We need to learn to trust him more. God bless you. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. God is so good. Amen. Let's all stand together and give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Amen. Hallelujah. God is good. God is so good. So good. So good. I enjoy the word that the bishop brought to us tonight. And I know in my life I found, found myself praying for something to happen and I already figured out what I wanted to happen so I prayed that that would happen and when it didn't happen I would go and pray about it again <laughs> and it still didn't have to go pray again and the same prayer wanting the same thing but I had to finally come to my senses and listen to the Lord saying this is not what I have planned for you you need something else and then when I woke up and realized God had already provided what I was praying for, even though it wasn't what I thought it should have been. 
If we can just have eyes to see and ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to His people, uh, you would be amazed at how many prayers God has already answered in your life if we would just wake up and realize it. I believe God has so many answered prayers out there for us. He's just waiting on us to, to see it and to receive it and to walk in it. The Bible says greater things are yet to come, that, that we greater things shall you do. And I believe that God is wanting us to step into greatness. But for us to step into the greatness that God has called us to do, we've got to recognize where He's calling us, what He's calling us to do, and not just sit around waiting for our will to be done. But we pray, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven that should be our prayer and that is our prayer the prayer of this church we want the will of God to be done we don't know what is going to happen in the future but we know who has the future in his hands and we can safely trust in the King of Kings and Lord of Lords our, the prayer answering God can you say amen let's lift our hands and thank God for his word tonight mighty God we love you we thank you so much for your word God, we pray that you would help us to realize and recognize, oh God, the prayers that you have answered. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to recognize your will for our life, individually and collectively as a family and as your church, oh God. Lord, we pray that you would go with us, lead us and guide us in the direction you would have us to go. We pray, not our will, but thy will be done. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And everyone together said amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here tonight. Thankful for all those joining us by ways of webcast. God bless you. We'll see you back on Sunday at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. God bless you. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Shake hands and be friendly.